What is up, Janksters? It's your boy, Graham, also known as HamHawks42 on the internet. And today, I'm gonna ask the question, did the March of the Machine storyline go hard enough? Um, we, we're not gonna be looking at individual cards today. There will be plenty of other videos where we talk about cards specifically. Uh, I will use cards in, visually to, to show some of the characters, but I'm gonna be talking specifically about the story. Uh, and on top of that, this is kind of the spoiler warning up front, I'm gonna be speaking as though you're familiar with the the storyline as to what happens. Uh, the March of the Machine story is a 10 part series over on the Wizards website. Uh, I will include a link to that in the show notes. If you have not read those as of yet, I would recommend checking them out. They're actually very well written. I gotta say, in general, I really like them. The authors all did a phenomenal job. And yes, authors, because there were a number of different authors um, between the main storyline and the side stories, because frankly, there was a ton going on. So if any one author were to take tackle this, I mean, it's a book. <laughs> like it's no, it's it's for real. It's legit. Anyway, so that said, um, uh, my goal today is to get into this and discuss what changed at the end. You know, well, what was different as a result of the events of March of the Machine, and I'm going to share my thoughts on whether or not I was happy and satisfied with where everything landed at the end of this story. Now, that said, as of this recording, the March of the Machine Aftermath set has not come out yet. We haven't seen the previews for that. And so presumably there will be more story to come kind of explaining how the different planes responded after they got kind of everything wrecked <laughs> during the war itself. And that's good because we need that. Um, that's very important because it ends at, at a point where like there doesn't really feel like there's much denouement at all. Um, in my opinion, so I didn't really feel like we were left with a firm, clear picture of what the multiverse actually looks like. But we saw a lot of individual characters go through transformations, and let's see why. So the other thing that's noteworthy here, I got back into the magic story really like hardcore more than just as a casual fan of the game um, with Phyrexia All We Won. With the Phyrexia teasers them releasing the notion that oh five planeswalkers are going to get completed and at that point we'd already seen tamio and ajani so it's like oh man this is going to be really intense and i wanted to know what was going on with these characters and what was going to happen so let's start by kind of going down that list and see so going into march of the machine there were seven planeswalkers that had been completed by Phyrexia. Uh, we had we, we had Jace, we had Vraska, we had Nahiri, we had Luka, we had Ajani, we had um, Tamio. So, okay, those are some big heavy hitters. So let's start with the ones that we know for a fact. Well, I'm just going to start with the ones we know are gone. Let's see the, where did they end up and how did they get there. So first things first, Luka. Um, Luca showed up uh, in the Ikoria side story and he got wrecked. Now, he was a very big, imposing, scary figure throughout the majority of that story, uh, which was really cool to see. And it took an apex predator of Ikoria to take him down. So, but he got wrenched out of a gigantic creation of metal and flesh that he had built and then crushed in a gigantic monster's jaws and then shot multiple times with the arc bow through his freaking heart. I'm very confident Luke is dead. And honestly, I don't care. <laughs> like honestly, if they had if they had kept Luca alive, I think a lot of people would have been disappointed because the character has been kind of uninteresting for the majority of the time he's been around. So like, all right, Luca had this big moment of being a villain, although he was kind of always a villain to be fair. But he had this big moment of villainy at the end, being a champion of Phyrexia that was terrorizing an entire plane. Um, and actually, and come to think of it, he leveraged the creatures around him in the in the creation of one gigantic monster, which was always kind of his deal. Like he was always very much um, trying to weaponize monsters. So, okay, he weaponized a whole bunch of monsters, but in the end, wasn't able to, wasn't able to accomplish his goal and Ikoria fought back and took him down. So, cool. All right, that, that was a, a satisfying conclusion to his arc, which is funny too, because he's a relatively new planeswalker. Like he was introduced in Ikoria, which came out just a handful of years ago. So he's one of those characters that they could have explored a lot more, but I don't think anyone really minds the fact that Luke is gone now. So, all right, rock on. Next up, I wanna talk about Tamio. So Tamio, Completed Sage, uh, well, was the card that we have depicted here. Tamio is the first completed Planeswalker that we ever saw get turned, and that was in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. It was kind of a big deal when she got captured, and it kind of rewrote 
what we knew of Phyrexia and how things were going to move forward. Like, this was the big moment for me when I realized, like, oh, crap. This Phyrexian arc that we're going... Like, we'd seen Vornclex on Kaldheim, but honestly, by the time New Capetta or uh, Kamigawa and Neon Dynasty came out, I had kind of, like, forgotten that, like, Vornclex had been a thing. Like, it, I don't know. It just didn't seem... It didn't. It seemed like kind of this flash in the pan. Huh? Someday we'll get back to that and figure out what that was all about. But this really let this and the, the inclusion of Jin to Texas really brought home. No, we're doing this. This is for real. And I thought that was cool. And so Tamio's completion was a big deal in the story. So what happened in March of the Machine? Well, in a battle over Tawashi, um, Tamio had a really tear-jerking moment with Nashi, her son, um, her, her her Nozumi. Uh, I don't know, foster son, adoptive son. I think adoptive is the word they use in the stories. Um, so adopted son. And uh, they have this really touching moment where it becomes very clear that Tamio is truly gone, you know, because Nashi tries to reason with her and Tamio effectively doesn't listen. Like there's almost a second where there, there's a part of the story that you see from her perspective where she's like screaming inside her own mind while her body is not in control or while she is not in control of her body. So there's that idea of like, oh, the, the soul is still here. The spark is still here. Like she is inside, but she, there's nothing she can do to prevent herself from being this agent of evil. That was really compelling and very interesting. But in the end, Tamiel played paper. The Eternal Wanderer played swords, or sorry, scissors. That's the joke. Rock, paper, scissors. And um, the Wanderer took down Tamiel. The, the Wanderer cut her down and Tamiel died. Like straight up died. Like just got sliced by a magically imbued blade that just, like she's gone. However, she has a lot of scrolls. Uh, the support of her deals is she has these like bound scrolls. That's always been Tamio's deal from what I understand. Uh, full of like incredibly powerful magic that she refuses to use, at least she refused to use prior to getting turned. And one of them, so like she opened one of them on the way out and it turns out it main, it included like this ghostly image of her. It was like, it was Tamio's backup, if you will. Uh, that was, it was her state, save state of her pre- completed self and so as a direct result tamio the body was completely destroyed but for some reason there's like this ghostly technological soul of tamio that still exists which felt so like i don't know i the the story was so good and it was so interesting and so compelling and then all of a sudden they did this like wiggly wobbly hand wavy um it's like oh but if we want to include tamio in future stories we can because there's this ghost kind of Eh? Eh? And then Nashi was was able to just kind of like, you know, hold his mom again, kind of. But it's like, it's bittersweet because it's not really her, but it's kind of her. And it's, I don't know. There are places they could go with it, but I fear it's just going to be a convenient excuse to kill Tamio without killing Tamio. And that feels like comic book logic and it bums me out. But honestly, that's what most of this is becoming. Um, actually, that's probably, the ship's probably way sailed on that. So I don't know. I just... I don't know. I was un unimpressed with the way that they handled that in the end, which is a bummer. Like it was so close to being excellent, but honestly, I would have loved, I would have been more moved by the story if the, if Tamio had been killed and that was it. Just let us have a moment that is irreversible and then try to recover from that. Those are where the emotions come in. That's where good storytelling happens, is where when stuff can't just get reversed. And so Tamio died, but didn't die. And we're gonna see that as being kind of a theme. And I don't love that. Uh, I don't love that because it, it kind of sucked the air out of all the stuff we had, out of the last year of storytelling since Neon Dynasty, um, I thought, anyway. So moving on, next one, Nihiri. I wanna talk about Nihiri. Um, in one of the stories on Zendikar, uh, Nahiri is in one of the Skyclaves doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and the adventurers that we know from Zendikar Rising, uh, Aura and um, Linvala, and they're, they're coming to... or And... Um, Akiri are coming to deal with Nahiri. So there's this fight between these, you know, between one incredibly powerful Lithomancer, who is, you know, this ancient creature that they're trying to battle um and then these groups of very mortal heroes cool like that's, that's a cool setup well i mean i'm into it like we got a, a clash of a titans kind of situation um and in proper zendikar fashion it was like this multifaceted adventuring party like cruising through one of the skyclaves beating up on completed elementals to try to get to the final boss fight that was kind of neat I, I gotta say the story was well done it was very fun um and in the end 
Nihiri gets, uh, like, blasted, kind of. Although in that story, we also see Linvala, who's an angel, burning away Phoresis off of someone. So it becomes clear that, like, oh, angels counteract the Phoresis, but even on Zendikar. Like, we, we, I feel like through a lot of the story, a ton of time had been spent on New Capenna angels. That New Capenna angels were somehow special. They could produce Halo, which is good to, like, prevent Phoresis or, you know, kind of as a safeguard against it. So, okay, I feel like a lot of work and a lot of time was spent in the story to establish that. Like, is it Halo's important. New Capenna angels are important. This all over here is super important. And then kind of in a moment, they're like, oh, and by the way... Zendikar angels can do it too. It's like, oh, okay. And I believe the intention of that is now to show that like angels across the entire multiverse have some kind of special power that helps them fight Phyrexia, which cool. Like obviously the heroes need some kind of weapons that are effective. So fine, I guess. But I don't know. That seemed, I don't know. It, it seemed kind of tacked on. Like I was expecting more of that. But in any event, then again, there's a ton of stuff going on, so I'm not going to get every little bit of everything I want uh, because this isn't a 10-part epic fantasy novel yet. I don't know. <laughs> Someday, maybe. But uh, actually, I guess they tried that with War of the Spark, and yuck. Anyway, so Nahiri was basically in the Skyclaves. The heroes, uh, Linvala especially, really like busted her up, won the day. And the Skyclave itself actually crashed into Zendikar with Nahiri inside as the heroes like flew away or line slung away to safety. So Nahiri is presumed dead, but she was off camera. And there was a moment where um, as Linvala was like radiating power, where Nahiri looked at her hands and like for a second, the look on her face showed like fear. So for a second, it looked like maybe Linvala's power was like undoing the, her, the completion in some way, or at least a little. So that was an interesting situation. And that's something that we might see. I, honestly, the moment I read that, I was just like, oh, so they're just going to say the angels fixed it all and we're good. But the, believe it or not, the story doesn't actually end with the angels just fix it all and we're good. At least not yet. We'll see how the aftermath plays out. But in any event, Nahiri is presumed dead. So, so far we've got three... We, we've got three planeswalkers who had been completed of the seven and uh, two and a half of them are dead. <laughs> so, okay. Who else do we have? Um, well, then we also have Nyssa. So Nyssa, the Ascended Animus. Well, again, that's the card, but Nyssa, we know Nyssa. Um, the elf, the, the, the mono green elf, who's just generally pretty cool and has been cool. So her beginning completed was a big story beat. It was scary. It was, um, it was... I don't know. It, it, it was kind of a big deal. Honestly, when this card got initially spoiled, I thought there's no way. Like, there's no way they would actually complete Nyssa. She's such an important character who's been so critical to the stories for so long. I can't believe they would do this. Well, turns out the marketing team was very successful and the story team was very successful in getting me engaged with the stories because they did complete Nyssa. However, at the end of the 10th uh, installment of the story, at the very end through a huge series of uh, conveniences, uh, a bunch of magic was somehow leveraged so that the day could be saved and Nyssa was was uncompleted. She got de Um And we, it, we it, like, it hits right at the end. So we haven't really had an opportunity to see the character react to what has happened, what she was. That's something we haven't seen yet. So I don't know if there are going to be any long-term ramifications on Nyssa for whether or not, like, whether or not she's going to be okay, like, mentally, um, emotionally, given what happened. I hope they explore that, because they really should. Um, that, like, that needs to be a big deal for this character moving forward. Otherwise, like, this whole... Like, I'll, I'll be very disappointed if this arc does not have a meaningful impact on these characters for the rest of the story moving forward. Because it was a huge deal. This should change who they are. So I hope it does. Um, because the fact that she's frankly alive and safe and not full of Phyrexian gunk anymore, like, I don't know. That seems too convenient. It seems too easy. And I don't like that. I don't like that at all. By the way, the way that the heroes were able to comp to finally defeat Phyrexia, I should touch on this. Um, the way they were able to finally defeat Phyrexia was Ren, the uh, the Dryad, 
Dryad Planeswalker was merged with Realm Breaker and actually used Realm Breaker itself, the tree that was creating the entire invasion that made all the portals to all the different realms possible. She actually used Realm Breaker to like swap, um, to, to swap Phyrexia, new Phyrexia with um, Zalfir, which is a continent that was on Dominaria that got phased out and was outside of existence for an incredibly long time. Apparently, Realm Breaker was strong enough to reach Zalfir, pull them into the story, which was cool, by the way, because Zalfir has been a hanging plot point in Magic Story for like 20 freaking years. And they really brought him back, which was really dope. And, but in so doing, she literally swapped places. Like they straight up just like, they did a little do si do and then all of a sudden, and now new Phyrexia is phased out outside of the multiverse. So it's technically not in the multiverse, it's in some kind of other place that somehow Realm Breaker could still reach. And now Zalfir is where new Phyrexia was in that little placement. And as a re result, through super plot convenience, super duper uber plot convenience, we find ourselves in a situation where the connection to New Phyrexia has been lost to the invading army. And apparently, because all of Phyrexians have some kind of hive mind, the moment they lost connection to their home plane, they all just sort of stopped. You know that moment in the video game when they ramp up the stakes? I'm thinking Mass Effect, I'm looking at you, Bioware. Um, when they ramp the stakes up and like, you're looking at the end of all things forever and then like the hero magically flips some kind of switch and then all the enemies just die and shut down. It's like that, it was that. That exact moment was exactly what happened. And I, I don't know, I was, I was hoping for better, but it is what it is. Um, it seemed like a weird ju justification for that flip switch too, but it happened. And uh, and as a result, that, that was also part of the reason we were able to justify healing the completed planeswalkers because they no longer had that connection to Phyrexia itself. And as a result, cleansing the oil, cleansing the mechanisms or whatever did bring them back to the previous state. Okay, fine. I suppose if, if it's gonna be, I realize the majority of this video, I've just been complaining about fantasy justifications in a fantasy story. I should probably knock that off so in any event. So Nissa safe, um, her and Chandra, by the way, they did retcon their retcons officially. Uh, the story ends with Nissa and Chandra actually kissing, which is just cool, good for them. I'm glad those two kids are having a good time uh, now that Nissa's back. The other one that uh, got, comp got fixed in all of that was a Johnny. So a Johnny was in that same little situation with them. And by the way, to to, to save Nissa and a Johnny, Malira, the 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 Mirin who was like one of the healers who knew how to deal with Phyresis, actually ended up giving up her life. So there we have a casualty. That was a legit casualty that actually happened. So Malira did. We we lost Malira. Um, which kind of bites, because she was a cool character, but again, well, it doesn't bite. We need to, our story needs stakes. That kind of, it stung. It stung for when Malira died. So, okay, great. But now, in order to save a Johnny and Nyssa, who were Planeswalker characters that people were had mourned when they got completed, but now they're back. Uh, so there were two other Planeswalkers that have gotten completed that are now safe. The, or sorry, that were not necessarily safe. There are two other planeswalkers who were completed that we haven't talked about yet, and that is Jace and Vraska. So Jace and Vraska both. Um, in the beginning of the story, Jace like pieces out, and Elishnor just assumes like, oh, he's off to to go spread my will somewhere, and we literally never see him again. Like we have no idea where he is or what he's doing. So Jace is 100% off camera at this point and has been throughout basically the entire story. Vraska, however, did lead a charge on Ravnica. And so she was actually one of the one of the Phyrexian generals on Ravnica and she got roughed up. She got completely busted up by uh, the citizens of Ravnica. And in the end though, it looks like she's on her way out. She has this vision. The story's told in her perspective, by the way. It's actually really intense. I, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, great story. And in the end, she has this, like, as it feels like, as it seems like she's dying, she has this vision of Jace. So she, like, so she's, like, potentially, either she's she was, like, in a, in a busted up state and a little loopy on her way out, which maybe, but 
it's also possible that she was somehow having some kind of mental link with Jace, who she loves, and they, they have a very strong connection, so okay. Um, and he's a mind mage, so all right. Like, so there might be something there, but it, it sort of happened, and we cut away, and then in the end of the story, uh, one of the Ravnican rebels, you know, one of the Ravnican fighters, um, asks where Vraska's body was, and they said they couldn't find it. So we don't know at the end of the day where Vraska is. So of our seven completed planeswalkers, we have two that full on died, presumably, assuming they don't do some kind of retcon with Nahiri. So Luca, totally dead. We saw the body, he got completely wrecked. We got um, Tamio, got completely wrecked. She got sliced in half, but she has this ghost thing. And then we have Nahiri, who was inside of Skyclave as it collapsed. Jace, unknown. Vraska, unknown. Nissa and Ajani, perfectly fine. So... Other than that, we did lose, we lost Malira, so she did in fact die, and I mentioned Ren. So Ren merged with Realmbreaker to bring Zalfir into the fight. Now, as you can imagine, this wrecked Ren. It was not easy, and it definitely overexerted Ren. Additionally, I want to point out one little detail that I thought was really funny throughout the course of this story. In the side story in Phyrexia, All Will Be One, at one point, Luca decides, hey, there's this Phyrexian beast here. I can bond with it, just like I did the monsters on Ikoria, and I can use it to fight for me. And it's funny, as the reader, like, I remember reading that being like, dude, like, that's not gonna end well. You're, you're trying to merge with the Borg, you idiot. It's not, like, you're gonna get completely overrun. It's gonna overpower you, and you're gonna get like completely screwed and this was just a random beast if i'm remembering correctly like so and that's exactly what happened so like dude luca you're an idiot you shouldn't have done that meanwhile throughout the whole story there were chapters upon chapters where the goal was to get realm to to get ren to realm breaker so that she could merge with it and people are like oh my goodness this is our last hope you're a hero this is amazing this is like gonna be th this is the way that you're gonna save the multiverse and i remember thinking like wait a minute if Luca merging with Phyrexia was a dumb move that got him killed, why is Ren merging with Phyrexia going to be super heroic and awesome? That seemed like a weird double standard to me. Like, how come Ren was able to merge with Realmbreaker and actually take control of Realmbreaker and leverage it to you to her will instead of being completely overpowered by it, just like Luca was? I thought that was interesting and kind of silly. However. They did justify it that is something about the fact when Ren merged with Realmbreaker or eight, as she called it, um, there was actually like a living tree at the center of it, at least like in its spirit, I guess its soul, like in the way that fantasy stories end up, you, we, we also, um, find ourselves inside of characters, minds in some kind of like spiritual realm quite a few times, which is fine. I, I, I'm, I'm cool with that. Um, and so Ren actually talks to like the sapling that's inside of Realmbreaker that Phyrexia has perverted and actually turn like befriends it. And that's kind of how, which presumably Ren does with all the trees that she merges with. Um, so, okay. Like that was an interesting look at that process. And I found it very interesting to follow Ren go through that. Um, but in the end, she overexerts herself doing this like weird planner shift thing. And presumably, and, well, and she does, pass away like she's you know she she dies ren dies however in a beautiful moment of plot convenience there was an acorn that teferi found sitting in front of ren so ren presumably like sprouted at some point and left a seed behind so that she could like replant herself which i don't know how dryads work maybe that's the thing is she the, maybe that makes perfect sense like with, within canon but again it's it's smacked of plot convenience it was just kind of like oh so another character has a big heroic arc that should be life-threatening and it is but not really and i don't know i it, we, we have we find ourselves in yet another situation where they, they could have given us a strong emotional beat and instead uh they took a character they, they gave a character a death scene but then just opened the door for us to just have her in future stories anyway which i don't know like again new ren young ren um could be interesting, like uh, uh, depending on how they write it. So there's an opportunity there. At least in that situation, Ren is irrevocably changed. 
which is not necessarily, and I suppose Tamio is too, which is not necessarily true for like Nissa and Ajani. They could just hand wave. Like honestly, the, in future stories, like the next story where Ajani shows up, they could write it as just, man, it was crazy what happened in Phyrexia, wasn't it? I know, right? Anyway, like on to adventure in this new plane. Like if they do that, I'm gonna be so disappointed. But anyway, they, they theoretically could because the characters other than what's inside their heads are otherwise unchanged. So yeah, freaking wild. Now there's one other one that I wanna mention, another character arc that was absolutely massive that took place here. And that is with Elspeth. So at the end of Phyrexia All Will Be One, Elspeth grabbed the Silex, this the magical bowl that is a, in fact a nuclear bomb, and, <laughs> well, I'm, uh, it's the power level, it's, it's this plane sundering massive bomb, right? She took it against her chest and planes walked away. Now, she was off screen, I knew full well that she was coming back. Like, you, you don't do that if you're writing these these kinds of stories. You don't give somebody such a, it, an, such a dynamic but ambiguous end if it's not uh, if it's not intended to be if the goal is not to undo it that's that's kind of that's where I'm going with this and uh, so and she comes back as Archangel Elspeth in March of the Machine so we've seen the card this is she comes back as an angel one of the stories is like it's it's a long short story it's like probably I don't know a couple thousand words of Elspeth talking with Sarah, the, the planeswalker, and I believe she's, I don't say God, I don't even know exactly what Sarah is, to be honest, because, like I said, I got into the story recently. So maybe there's some details just by Sarah's inclusion in this story that I'm missing as a relatively new Vorthos. But there's a huge storyline where Elspeth was talking to Sarah about where to where to come back, where to re rejoin, and watching what was happening on all these other planes as the battles were raging, which gave us a cool opportunity to kind of do a do a quick check. Okay, where are all the other planes? That's neat. I liked that. That was a cool way, a cool dynamic way to kind of see how the battle was raging across all these other areas in a relatively short amount of time. And then that story ended with Elspeth getting reborn as Archangel Elspeth and jumping into the heart of New Phyrexia in the middle of the battle and confronting Elishnorn. Cool. Like, this, there was a cool, powerful moment. However, at the end of that story, I found myself sitting back, kind of scratching my head, going like, wait a minute. Okay, so I know that she ascended to angelhood. I still don't know how she did that. And I still don't know how she survived. Or did she survive? Was this like a Gandalf the White kind of situation? And did she full on die and get reborn? I'm assuming it's something like that, but I genuinely don't know because that was super vague. So this was like the hand waviest of hand waves. But by the way, we could all see it coming for a number of reasons. One, the character was killed off screen. Also, Elspeth didn't get a card in Phyrexia All Will Be One despite being like one of the key protagonists in the storyline. Like the the stories, the story articles from All Will Be One followed Elspeth like as much as, if not more than any other character there. And so the fact that she wasn't a card in the set meant that she was gonna be a card in the next one. Like that was like, duh, that was kind of given. So of course she's here, of course she's fine, of course she was reborn. Like. But I'm also, but I find myself frustrated now having read the stories and I still don't know how it happened. <laughs> so if you are aware, if I missed something or if there was some reference to like an older story beat that I am unaware of, because admittedly my magic lore is within the last couple of years is really where I've been focusing. So if there's something I missed, please let me know. Let me know in the comments below. I would really appreciate it. So, but in short, I guess what it comes down to, bottom line, the stories are all very well done. I am glad that Wizards has brought us onto this journey over the last year to really explore this new Phyrexian invasion. Um, it has been an interesting ride and I'm glad I've done it. However, in the end, I feel like there's a lot of destruction on various planes, a ton of characters who like were throughout the different realms have presumably died or been hurt and changed in some way. And we will likely see the impact of these events ripple throughout the future. I hope so anyway. But at the end of the day, like the, for, the multiverse is still open. The planeswalkers can still bounce around at will. And Phyrexia just kind of got blue screened. Like they just kind of got alt F4'd out and we're done. 
Like, it, it seems kind of lackluster. I'm very interested to see in the aftermath because I have no doubt there were many, um, many beats throughout the course of the of the other planes where characters that we just didn't have an opportunity to see now are in fact gone. Like we know the Kenris, um, the, the King and queen on Eldrain don't, don't survive. We also know that, um, well, but actually not, but even like a number of characters have gotten completed. Like, and I don't know the only one that I'm actually in the story. I, we saw a Tali, the dinosaur, the, the red aligned dinosaur, the elder dinosaur on Ixalan. We saw a Tali die. That happened. Sakama just totally wrecked Atali. Um, so we know that. We saw Heliod get killed as well. Kaya, Kaya got Heliod. And then Atraxa also totally bit it. But for the but other than that, like if a character got completed, I'm not confident that they're not gonna get cured. Because we've established now that it can happen. And angels have some kind of ability to like burn it away. So I don't know. I have a feeling it's it. What could have been a truly game-changing, multiverse-shattering event, ended up being just like a nasty storm where we're gonna be doing cleanup for a while. And I don't know. I was hoping for more. I was hoping for a bigger impact. Maybe I'm a little jaded. I love it when when characters I care about die in media. That's why I was a Joss Whedon fan for so many years. It just is what it is. But in any event, thank you for going with me on this kind of ramble as I kind of parse what ended up happening throughout the course of the story stories and kind of where we ended up, kind of what the score is, if you will. And uh, at the end of the day, Heroes definitely came out on top by a mile. Oh, by the way, also all of the uh, Praetors, every single Praetor got killed on screen violently. They're all gone. So Praetors are no longer a thing. They're, they've all been destroyed. And like I said, Atraxa was inside or was on New Capenna when a literal building, like Park Heights, actually, when I say a building, like, I mean, like New Capenna buildings are like cities. <laughs> um, no. I don't know, like neighborhoods, like a whole neighborhood basically just collapsed on top of a track. So like she gone too. I'm, <laughs> I'm very confident. She's not going to be a factor anymore either. So at the end of the day, heroes came out on top kind of by a lot. And, uh, I don't see a lot of hype was made about how the game will be changing forever as a result of this set. And I don't see it on this kind of a bummer, but in any event, thank you so much for going with me on this ramble. I appreciate you. And uh, if you're enjoying, if you want to hear more of my thoughts, by the way, I stream over on Twitch. So if long form thoughts are something that you want, I play primarily arena over there. Although I do commander content as well from time to time, twitch.tv slash hammocks 42. I would love to see you over there. That's definitely my primary medium. Like I'm, I'm here on YouTube quite a bit, but the truth of the matter is streaming is like, I don't know when people say I'm a content creator or people are content creators. That's one thing. I think of myself as a streamer. That is what I love to do. So that's where you can find me more, more often than not. But in any event, hopefully I see you out there. If not, you can hit that subscribe button. I'm not, I'm not done here on YouTube either. So uh, yeah, I have more thoughts and we're, we'll be doing more previews as well. Talking about the preview cards that, that have come out um, as well as a detail breakdown on battle. I know my last battle video was maybe a little lackluster. So we're going to de detail that in more detail moving forward. So thank you so much. I appreciate you and I'll catch you on the next one.